At its most basic level, IFR flying is about venturing into weather that would otherwise keep us grounded. But an instrument rating isn't a license to fly in any conditions, and it doesn't make pre-flight weather assessment any less important. Quite the contrary, in fact, especially for pilots with less experience. The lion's share of your training is, is spent in the, in the terminal world, instrument procedure after instrument procedure, holding patterns, and very little, very little mandated and required in terms of en route instrument planning. In this video, we'll touch on the biggest weather hazards for IFR flight, along with basic strategies for anticipating them during pre-flight planning. In other videos, we'll delve more deeply into actual weather decision-making before and during flight. Flying IFR both simplifies and complicates weather planning. There are fewer no-go situations, but more time spent in weather means more room for error and more uncertainty in planning. The main goal of pre-flight planning is to erase as much of that uncertainty as possible, to develop an increasingly sharp picture of the large-scale weather situation and the likely danger points. Let's turn our focus to the most common danger points, low ceilings and visibility, airframe icing, and convective activity. Flying in low visibility is what IFR is all about but an instrument rating is no guarantee that it's safe to fly anywhere close to minimums, or even in the clouds for that matter. It's important to approach these planning situations with a clear sense of your own limits, as they are today, not six months or six years ago. Instrument flying skills deteriorate quickly, and it's easy to overestimate your own proficiency. There's also the gap between training and reality. The instructor says go visual or you're at minimums and you take the foggles off and you're seeing your seven or eight miles of clear VFR day. That transition into a half mile visibility day is again very different. Proficiency aside, during the planning phase, an issue that often confronts pilots of light aircraft is a weather system that brings low IFR ceilings and visibilities across a large area. Here, the question should not be, can I get in, so much as, can I get out? Um, yes, there is an edge to every weather system, um, but if you, if you choose an alternate that is within sort of the local vicinity of your primary destination airport, there's a good chance the weather there is going to be exactly the same. A skeptical outlook coupled with careful fuel planning is critical here. The rule of thumb is to start out with twice what you think you'll need. That may sound excessive, but we all know the old saying about too much fuel. Of course, alternate planning is important even in less challenging conditions. Just because the weather is not low enough for you to legally be required to file an alternate doesn't mean you shouldn't always try to have an alternate in mind. Actually go through the process of, of choosing an alternate even though you don't legally need to and put that in your flight plan. It'll, it'll force you to carry enough fuel that you can make it to an airport where you should be able to get in, um, but it will also give air traffic control an idea of maybe what you might plan to do if for whatever reason you decide not to go to your primary airport. Convective activity feeds on heat, which is why it's generally better to fly in the morning during thunderstorm season. But thunderstorms aren't always towering mushroom clouds that you can see from 100 miles away. You know, you might have a day where it's, you know, overcast at 2,000 and, and generally looks like an okay day to, to go fly IFR. Um, but if you start, you know, reading into the weather a little bit further, you might see, hey, there's a, there's a convective outlook or worse, there may be convective sigmets out there. And if you start seeing that kind of thing, you know, that could indicate that there may be uh, embedded thunderstorms, which are a major concern you may end up in a thunderstorm without ever realizing it was there. Data link radar in the cockpit is hugely helpful in this regard, but there are caveats. Because of the latency associated with NEXRAD images transmitted to the cockpit, data link users need to approach planning with the idea of avoiding large areas of weather rather than threading their way through it. Another radar related issue is distinguishing between heavy precip that stems from convective activity and plain old heavy rain. Part of the answer comes from an understanding of the basic weather situation, but there are other clues as well. First, is there lightning? 
How steep are the precipitation gradients? Seeing red on the radar may not tell you as much as you think. The colors aren't standardized, so you really need to look at the decibel levels. As a general rule, non-convective precipitation tops out at about 40 decibels. Anything above that is probably coming out of a thunderstorm. We tend to think of ice as a winter problem in the northern part of the country, but it's not that simple. Anywhere there's visible moisture and the temperature falls to freezing, there's the potential for ice. It is possible to get icing at the altitudes where we normally fly in our smaller airplanes, even when the weather is, you know, windbreaker weather at the surface. You know, if you're, if you're planning to fly at, you know, 9,000 feet and it's, you know, only 50 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface, there's a decent chance that you may run into ice if you find yourself flying in, in rain or even flying through clouds. Fortunately, icing forecast tools are a lot better than they used to be. So we have these great graphical tools at aviationweather.gov uh, that will give you lowest freezing levels, it will give you icing probabilities. All of those, especially for the instrument pilots out there that are likely that could be flying into visible conditions with temperatures less than freezing, you know, you don't want to penetrate massive areas of predicted icing conditions. It just gives you such few options. It's also a good idea to look carefully at freezing levels in relation to your planned altitude. Keep in mind that the danger zone starts a few degrees above freezing and that you don't need to actually be in clouds to pick up ice. If you're going to be flying uh, below a cloud layer in the wintertime especially, you know, any kind of precip that's going to be coming out of that cloud may freeze on contact with your airplane. Ice is particularly treacherous in the mountains, where pilots can easily find themselves trapped between high terrain and the diminishing performance of an ice-laden aircraft. You have to think about obstacle avoidance, uh, especially with so much direct-to navigation these days. Um, without the benefit of charted airways and minimum and route altitudes, more pilots should be relying on those, you know, off-route obstruction clearance altitudes, and especially how then that affects your potential cruising altitudes, and then your potential for turbulence, icing conditions. Data link radar can also be helpful here, but keep in mind that the radar can't see the temperature of precipitation. The colors you see are based on algorithms that predict the line between liquid and freezing precip, but they're not exact. So just because you see green rather than pink or blue doesn't mean it's safe. With IFR, as with VFR, it's generally not exotic weather that gets us into trouble. The uncomfortable truth is that it's usually pretty mundane weather coupled with a pilot whose basic instrument flying skills have atrophied. As with most things, the key is to devote a little extra time and effort. It has to involve more than just your trips to the airport and preparing for a specific flight. There's just not enough opportunity for us. We have to develop, I think, a, a healthy addiction to weather, to watching weather, to seeing how weather develops. If a weather addiction is asking too much, don't be discouraged. When all said and done, basic weather knowledge, coupled with proficiency and sound judgment, is enough to keep you safe in almost any instrument flying situation.